this book of mine came out uh, last summer, um, and <clears throat> I uh, uh, have had a great opportunity to engage in a lot of different conversations with very different uh, groups around the country um, on some of its ideas. Uh, but uh, when I happened to have bumped into uh, uh, John's colleague Jan, uh, actually in Seattle where I live, um, and we cooked up the idea of doing an event together, uh, it got me really excited because I feel like this is uh, an organization and you all as uh, uh, people in the network here um, of the National Committee, an organization that is just um, doing so much of the work concretely that I write about ideally, uh, of building bridges, of really trying to embody understanding uh, across uh, different modes of, uh, of cultural identity and understanding, um, and really exploring the meaning of identity, both here in the United States, uh, in China, and, uh, um, and, and between the two. So uh, what I thought uh, we would do is just, uh, I would speak for a, a few minutes at the outset to, to tell you just a bit about uh, some of the themes and ideas and arguments and even a couple of the stories uh, uh, in this book. Um, and then really open it up uh, with John uh, just for a, a conversation. Uh, and I'm happy if it takes the form of Q&A, but it need not only take that form. I'd be very excited just to hear uh, everybody responding to everybody else as we uh, um, get the conversation going. Um, so uh, this book, I, I think one place to start actually uh, with The Chinaman's Chance is simply with the title. Um, and to tell you a little bit of the story about how uh, it came to be the title. Um, many of you know that uh, that phrase, a Chinaman's chance, is, uh, has, has a long and undistinguished history in American vocabulary. Um, it's a phrase that really came into popular usage uh, around the time that Chinese uh, migrants, laborers, uh, started coming to the United States in significant numbers. Uh, and often, uh, whether they were laying track for the railroads or mining mountains or uh, doing other work in, uh, in the American West, uh, often had some of the most thankless, dangerous, sometimes life-threatening tasks, such that the figure of speech simply arose that uh, um, to have a Chinaman's chance meant essentially to have no chance in hell, right? Of surviving, of making it, of having a shot in life, so on and so forth. Uh, and that phrase stuck in the American vocabulary, uh, such that uh, fast forward 100 years, when my father immigrated to the United States in the late 1950s, um, somewhere along the way, he heard this phrase. Somewhere, somewhere along the way, uh, he picked it up. It was uh, just in common parlance and usage at the time. And I never did get to ask my father um, whether the first time or two he heard this phrase, it was actually um, directed at him or simply said in his presence, uh, perhaps as if he weren't e even there or that, as if he wouldn't be offended by it. Uh, I'm not sure, frankly, which would have been worse. But in either case, um, the, the idea uh, that this phrase was still in usage is, is itself telling. Well, my dad um, uh, was a, a, a sponge for language and idiom and slang. And, uh, uh, and he, uh, when he heard that phrase and he understood its meaning, uh, he did a very, what I think of as a, an American thing. He took that dart, that verbal dart that was directed at him and people like him, uh, and he grabbed it midair and he decided to redirect it. And so my father, uh, when I was growing up, uh, uh, would very often just use that phrase with a kind of an impish, ironic uh, uh, sense of humor and apply it to everyday prosaic situations, right? So I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, so rooting for the Yankees. So if the Yankees were down by five runs in the ninth inning, and we were watching a game on WPIX, he'd turn to me and he'd say, oh, Eric, they have a Chinaman's chance of winning this game. <laughs> you know? uh, or if we were you know, uh, trying to get to ShopRite before it closed uh, at nine and we were still 15 minutes away, um, you know, he would say, oh, we have a Chinaman's chance of getting there on time. Right? And he'd, he'd say this kind of uh, um, with, with mischief to needle me to see if he'd get a rise out of me. But uh, also, as I say, as an act of very American reappropriation, reclaiming. Right? And, um, that, that, it's a bit in honor of uh, his act uh, of reclaiming that language that uh, I titled the book A Chinaman's Chance. Uh, but of course, in more metaphorical terms, it reverberates as well. Uh, because you know, to me, the, the impetus for writing this book about fundamentally about being Chinese American in this age of China and America um, brings to the surface all kinds of questions about chance, about opportunity, uh, about the ways in which uh, you know, chance, both in the sense of 
having a fair shot and chance in the sense of random twists of fate um, leading to one pathway of life or another um, have played out certainly in the arc of my own family's life and journey, but it also plays out today um, in the evolving and very significant relationship between the United States and China. Uh, and so it's, uh, this book fundamentally tries to weave together uh, those two strands of story. Uh, on the one hand, the arc of my family's arrival uh, here in the United States, both literal and figurative. Um, and on the other hand, the arrival in the sense of China uh, on the world scene, uh, and th therefore the arrival of a new kind of relationship between um, the country uh, for whom the last century was named and the country for whom perhaps this next, this current century is going to be named. Uh, and, uh, and the entwining of these two stories um, the story of the Liu family and the story of, um, again, this age of China and America um, are meant to really um, bring up broader themes uh, for me as an American just about the most basic fundamental American question, which is this, who is us? Who is us? We are gathering here tonight at a time not only when China is rising and America's sense of itself and its place in, in the world and in history is um, uh, shifting. Uh, but we're also gathering here at a time of incredible demographic flux, of nearly unprecedented inequality in the United States, uh, where the social fabric is changing, getting remade, getting stretched, getting rewoven uh, in American life. And so that most fundamental question, uh, who is us? How do we define American? Um, is I think in some ways there, there's no better way to explore that question actually than to look at it through the lens of Chinese American identity um, in this moment. Uh, and so that's really the, the essence and the heart of the book. Um, my own family story, this first strand uh, of the double helix uh, of, of this book, um, is a story that, um, as I say, you know, early on, you can look at it in a couple of different ways depending on what form of meta-narrative or mythology uh, of American immigrant arrival you want to hew to. Um, one way, for instance, my mother, I tell a short story in the book about uh, my mother's arrival in the United States. Uh, one way to tell the story is that uh, uh, my mother, uh, uh, when, she, uh, left, when she left Taiwan and came to the United States, uh, she arrived uh, in the cargo compartment of a cargo ship that went through the Panama Canal uh, stopped at Baltimore Port. She got out of Baltimore Port. She didn't know anybody there. She was very confusing. Um, and by her own wits and self-sufficiency and her own gumption, she made her way in American life, found her way up to New York City, uh, got herself a job, and then uh, began a, a foothold into a, a, an American life. That's one way to tell her story. Another way to tell her story, oh, P.S. actually, the, the, the conclusion of that story when she got to New York City uh, was that one of her first jobs in New York City uh, was as a file clerk um, uh, at a large, I think still existent, uh, a coffee company in that base in Manhattan called Chock Full of Nuts. Um, and she was a file clerk at this company and just had these jobs of you know, passing out forms and paperwork and paychecks uh, uh, every couple weeks around the office. And at this company, uh, my mother, this shy Chinese immigrant woman, uh, had few friends, but one person befriended her, uh, kept an eye out for her. This was an older uh, African-American executive at the company um, who uh, started to exchange pleasantries with her in the elevator, and then as he watched her make her way in the company, told his secretary to keep an eye out uh, uh, for my mom and make sure that uh, uh, she was going to make it here. Uh, his name was Mr. Robinson, uh, and all those years uh, working with him, she just thought of him as this really kind of kind guardian angel figure in the company. And it wasn't until many years later when I was a kid and was, um, uh, you know, beca become a baseball fanatic uh, that she told me about this guy whose uh, name, Mr. Robinson, was actually Mr. Jackie Robinson, uh, uh, who in his retirement from baseball had taken a job as an executive at Chop Full of Nuts. Uh, so one way to tell my mother's story is the story of a um, lone woman coming to the United States with nothing, just her own wits and her own gumption making her way and ending up uh, touching a mythic American and having her life here begin that way. But there's another way to tell that story, too. 
And the other way to tell it is to recognize, if you zoom out just a little bit, the fuller weave and context of social, educational, intellectual, relationship, capital uh, that my mother brought in her migration. That when she left Taiwan in the first place, uh, she was leaving as the daughter of a professor of European history at Taida, at Taiwan University. Um, that when she came to the United States, yes, strictly speaking, she didn't have much cash in her pocket, but that's only because when her ship stopped in Tokyo, uh, she had decided on a, on a kind of a, a profit-making scheme to spend money and buy an expensive camera in Tokyo on the idea that she would sell it for a profit here in the United States, right? Uh, and yes, it's true, when she arrived at Baltimore Port, um, nobody was there immediately to greet her, but then within an hour or two, uh, former students of her father, uh, who now live in the United States, came down and met her. Uh, and yes, it's true that she had to kind of make her own way when she got to New York City. Uh, but at every turn, from the first places she had to stay to the first people who helped her get her first job, uh, she had people who were connections, uh, who were family friends, who were part of this wider web of capital uh, that helped ease her transition into the United States. Uh, and that even the presence of a figure like Jackie Robinson, uh, mythic though he may have been, uh, was just yet another sign that uh, there was nothing my mother did that she did merely as some rugged individualist. She did not make herself. She was made by many people she encountered uh, along the way. That second way of telling her story of arrival, um, I think is, well, it raises a bigger question about the kinds of stories we tell about ourselves here in America today, and the kinds of stories we tell about the, the persistence of mobility, of social mobility in the United States at a time, again, when uh, China's economic rise and dynamism and uh, centrality uh, make the United States feel both in relative and in absolute terms uh, like we are stagnant. Uh, and, uh, but when you look at it in that context and understand that um, though we are tempted to mythologize the story either of an, a single immigrant like my mother or of an entire group of four million immigrants like Chinese Americans, uh, and when we are tempted to describe Chinese Americans in the terms that are often prevalent in American discourse, which is as a model minority, as a model minority which, uh, again, just by its, you know, their own wits and gumption and uh, superior uh, uh, skills have made their own way and, uh, uh, and succeeded in American life, what that does is it obscures a great deal of the picture. It obscures the many times over, the many millions magnified versions of all the people who helped bring someone like my mother uh, into this country and into American life. It also obscures the fact that even among the four million Chinese Americans today, there are nearly half a million, many of whom are in this city and in this metro region, who are living in the, uh, under the federal poverty line, who do not fit remotely the stereotype image of the high achieving, uh, you know, uh, high income earning, uh, model minority successful stereotype, uh, and that when you have that kind of uh, reality uh, in the Chinese American community being obscured by simply a choice of narrative, uh, it makes you appreciate the power and the centrality of our choice of narrative, uh, and how it reverberates out from the way that we tell our own family stories to the way we tell this bigger story of us. Uh, and so. A lot of the book um, I write about beginning not only with the arrival of my mother and father in the United States, uh, but then reflecting in my own life uh, growing up here as a second generation Chinese American, um, making sense of what parts of my identity, what parts of my public life and work um, have been shaped by my Chineseness. Um, you know, as I think the bio here says, uh, my, my work today, uh, in addition to writing, uh, centers around uh, running an organization, a nonprofit called Citizen University. And all of our efforts at Citizen University are dedicated to promoting and teaching uh, the art and the practice of powerful citizenship here in the United States. What it means to show up, claim ownership, claim voice uh, uh, as a pro-social, contributing, self-governing member of our community and our country, right? Uh, and one of the things that I've come to realize uh, in recent years as I've been reflecting, and partly this is just age and the fact that um, we're at a phase of life where I've got a teenage daughter, a third generation Chinese American who is ethnically only half Chinese, and uh, partly it's just about uh, uh, where we are in history right now, but I've had great cause just to reflect on the ways in which my Chineseness, my having grown up in a Chinese household, my having been saturated 
in Chinese language, Chinese custom, Chinese mores, Chinese ethics, Chinese ways of just expressing the smallest things, um, the ways in which all of that formation now influence my act of being American, influence the way that I go about talking about promoting, teaching, agitating, and organizing around uh, powerful citizenship in the United States. Uh, and when you connect those dots, or at least when I connect those dots, I see a rather bright line. Some of the language that I speak when I talk about citizenship in the United States today is that we have a culture that is overly weighted on rights and underweighted on responsibilities. I talk about a civic culture in the United States that is too fixated on rugged individualism, on individual autonomy, on a negative definition of liberty that says basically don't tread on me, but neglects again the larger fabric of relationship and obligation and duty that every one of us is actually woven into if we're gonna be part of a healthy functioning community and society. Now, there are different antecedents for this view of civic life in America. There's one strand of antecedent that goes all the way back to some of our founders and framers. Thomas Jefferson, who was very influenced by thinkers of the Scottish Enlightenment, who thought about rights not as freestanding, but as connected with duties. Um, that's definitely an echo of that. But another antecedent for me personally of this view of what it really means to show up as a citizen uh, is actually a Confucian antecedent and understanding that there is no such thing as self-made man or woman. There is no point in talking about the self as some free-floating, freestanding thing disconnected from either relationships uh, or from history or tradition. And that, the, and that to do so is not only ahistorical, it's antisocial. It is nearly pathological, right? Uh, and that Confucian ethic and understanding of the ways in which we are situated, as I say, in this web of relationship and obligation I'm not sure that 15 or 20 or 25 years ago when I first started to make my way in American politics and worked in Washington, D.C. for President Clinton, I'm not sure back then that I would have been able to articulate the ways in which my Chineseness have shaped my Americanness. Uh, but uh, as I say, my phase of life right now and this moment that we are in of China and America, where in all of our culture, political, uh, economic, popular, uh, artistic culture, these reverberations between uh, these two poles uh, of economic and civic identity uh, in the world are influencing just that self-story. Which brings me now to that second strand of, of narrative DNA here that w weaves throughout the book, and that is the larger story of um, America and China. Uh, and you know, one of the things that um, uh, I'm really attuned to um, as a Chinese American is the deep civilizational cultural strengths of Chineseness, in contrast with the what I think of as the uh, underappreciated fragility of today's actual Chinese society. Uh, I think there is, uh, as much as a lot of popular media narrative today paints China uh, as a rising tiger and, uh, and perhaps in some cases a threat uh, to the United States, there's far more fragility there uh, than the average American sees, recognizes, appreciates, or wants to acknowledge. Uh, and I think uh, that fragility is not only economic, it's civic. Uh, and you see it, you can pretty much open any day's newspaper uh, and, and see it. I mean, on, in, in tomorrow's New York Times, one of the uh, headline articles will be uh, a story about how um, uh, the, the Chinese internet community is uh, beginning to resist the ways in which the government now is not just shutting down primary, uh, or regulating primary uh, forms of access to the internet, but uh, also now um, heavy-handedly uh, weighing in on uh, these kind of workaround VPN uh, networks uh, that a lot of artists and, and intellectuals and scientists have used to remain in touch with the rest of the world. Um, when things like that happen, from an American perspective, uh, to me it's not just a, you know, it's not some simple matter of freedom is being trampled. It is rather a more complex matter of this is interesting. This is interesting that the government of China feels it must do this, and it bespeaks, again, a certain fragility um, uh, beneath the facade of, uh, of might and assent right now. Uh, and I think that larger context, understanding the complexity and even the layers of fragility that exist in China, of course, can be said and must be said uh, about the United States right now, right? I, I've already alluded to the fact that we're living through 
uh, this nearly unprecedented <coughs> period of inequality and concentration of wealth. Um, and it's a period that uh, tests not only the viability of our economy, but really the viability of our democracy. Uh, because economic inequality begets political inequality, which then begets economic inequality, which then begets political inequality, uh, and creates this vicious downward spiral. Uh, and we are well along the way, a couple turns down that spiral, uh, in that cycle here in the United States. Uh, and I think a lot of the reckoning that we've got to do uh, as Americans uh, has to do with facing that, not really having to do with uh, meeting the quote unquote competitive threat that China poses or uh, matching uh, in some way the challenge that uh, uh, China embodies. Uh, we've got to start taking care of business here in the United States uh, and, and cleaning up our own house. Uh, and, and you know, to me, one of the most um, uh, important things to remember about the U.S.-China relationship uh, that it's very easy, I think, to remember when you are a second generation Chinese American is simply this. You know, the, the day may come if we remain on current force and speed in X number of years when China's GDP surpasses that of the United States and uh, China gets to, for the first time, wave this great number one flag, right? Uh, and I'm sure for a lot of Americans that will be a political and a psychological blow and it will be cause for a lot of hand wringing and a lot of anxiety and um, you know, who knows? It could be a, a sort of an economic Sputnik moment uh, for the United States. But when I think about that day coming sometime down the road, I, I frankly am not worried. I, I actually say let it come. Uh, and, and the reason why I'm not worried is that uh, e for all of China's uh, economic might, the United States, I believe, retains this deep and enduring competitive advantage, uh, which I boil down very simply this way. America makes Chinese <coughs> American. China does not make American Chinese. China does not want to, does not know how to, is not particularly interested in, and is not set up either civilizationally or legally or culturally uh, to take large numbers of newcomers from other uh, countries around the world, uh, to welcome them, to integrate them as immigrants, to uh, fuse them into civic, social, political, economic life, and indeed empower them to, over time, redefine the very base notion of Chineseness. That's just not what China is about. Right? But that is what the United States is about. That is the very point of the United States, not only in our legal, but again, in our cultural and ethical ecosystem, that we are the planet's hybridizer of bloodlines, of means, of ideas, of styles, of norms, of voices, uh, and that that remains both exceptional and indispensable, to use two words that are overused uh, and underthought out in a lot of political discourse. It is, in fact, exceptional and indispensable uh, just for the evolution of planet Earth, uh, that there be a country like the United States that has that operating system, that does that welcoming, that does that integration, and that does that hybridizing. But there's one caveat that I have to add to this, and the caveat is simply this, if we don't blow it. If we don't blow it. And I think there are two profound ways that we uh, can blow it. Uh, the first, of course, in the United States is simply succumbing uh, to a politics of nativism, and xenophobia, and fear, and restrictionism. Um, and you know, there's always been a strain of those politics uh, in American life, but uh, uh, it's waxed and waned at different times. And if we let that strain get stronger, if we let our politics get dominated by um, you know, a, a view of the world that says we ought to close ourselves off, we ought to uh, you know, deport people who are in our midst who have been longtime contributors, and neighbors, and friends, and coworkers of ours, and classmates of our children, uh, if we want to start defining American identity in, in terms of kind of the purity test and identity fundamentalism that now prevails in certain parts of Europe, um, that we will be blowing our greatest competitive advantage. And unfortunately, the nature of things in a complex, multicultural, uh, diverse society is that they tend toward entropy. They tend toward that kind of falling apart. Uh, that is the default. So it takes affirmative, intentional, mindful, continuous effort for us actually to be stitching together a greater community uh, th that involves and, and blends together uh, all of these different cultural strands. The other way in which the United States could blow it in this age of China and America, uh, of course, uh, uh, has to do with what I've alluded to already a couple of times, which is that we let ourselves um, uh, become uh, kind of structurally not just temporarily, but structurally and permanently um, unequal and two nations. 
Um, some of you may have seen front page of the Wall Street Journal today. Uh, had an article that I was not proud, focused a lot on um, some of the economy of the Seattle area where, I was, where I'm from uh, as a case study for a larger phenomenon happening in the United States, which is basically um, we, the middle class is evaporating. We have an economy uh, where sales are booming at the top, luxury goods, uh, you know, uh, things that appeal to the top 5%, uh, and things are still going pretty strong at the bottom. Uh, dollar stores, economy stores, discount stores, off-brand uh, generics, and the rest. Uh, but the broad middle, the broad middle is evaporating. Uh, and this Wall Street Journal piece, front page story, talked about uh, a home builder called Quadrant Homes that even as recently as six, seven, eight years ago uh, had as its sweet spot the building of uh, homes for about $250,000, custom-made $250,000 homes in the Seattle area that a middle-class family could, uh, uh, with a little stretching, afford and make it and start a life in. Uh, the market for those homes has, has disappeared, right? And so they are basically going upscale, building only four hundred fifty dollars or $500,000 homes uh, and letting other people worry about the far, far bottom uh, of the scale, right? Uh, the middle is evaporating. And, and this is not just a matter, um, I happen to be a progressive and to have uh, you know, uh, views of, uh, uh, of life that are about compassion. The argument for sustaining uh, and preventing the evaporation of the middle class is not an argument based on compassion. It is not an argument about niceness. It is not an argument uh, about we should be more thoughtful and kind toward the struggling uh, working Americans. Uh, it is an argument based completely on self-interest properly understood. That the only way this national economy remains robust and vibrant is if everybody can actually participate in it. Uh, and we are headed, again, on current course and speed uh, to a place where great, great pluralities of American uh, citizens uh, cannot afford to be meaningful American consumers uh, or American contributors or participants in the economy. If that day comes, uh, where we have a truly hollowed out middle class and just a high end uh, that's driving aggregate GDP and a low end that is barely scraping along and requiring ever more government support, um, uh, we're not going to be in a position to uh, keep up with China. We're not going to be in a position to keep up with our neighbors in North America uh, or, or even in the OECD. Uh, and so this second dimension of if we don't blow it um, is incredibly important and it is very tied just to close the circle here, again, to the future of China and China's economy. Uh, all the ways in which uh, the relative slowdown in China's growth, the ways in which China's having to shift, uh, first gradually and now with seemingly more urgency from an export-led uh, growth model to an internal consumer-driven model, all of these things will have reverberating consequences for the American middle class. Uh, they are actually probably gonna make it a little more challenging over time uh, for the American middle class. Uh, and so one of the things that we've got to reckon with, uh, whether we are, whether our, our national identities are primarily American or primarily Chinese, uh, as long as we care about this interdependent, deeply interdependent, inextricable relationship between the United States and China, we've got to see the ways in which the fate of China's middle class is bound up with the fate of, of America's middle class and begin a new conversation about that that is constructive for both and positive for the world. Uh, because the alternative is one in which people in both countries start to see uh, that as a zero sum game uh, and see the rise of China's middle class as something that is working to the detriment uh, of America's middle class. And when that day comes, we get to another theme which runs throughout the pages of my book, uh, which is that, again, when we ask the question, who is us? When I say the word American, and I do the word association game, and a picture pops in your head, um, is the picture, for many, many, well, for most of the country's history, that picture was not just a white person, it was a white man. When you said American, when I said American, you saw a white man, right? Uh, that day is passing demographically, uh, but it's not yet passing politically, it's not yet passing culturally, right? Uh, and one of the things that we've got to attend to whether you are Chinese American or not, uh, is the, again, the danger that's inherent when people like me here in the United States, Chinese Americans and other Asian Americans, uh, labor under a, under a particularly noxious presumption, which is this, presumed foreign until proven otherwise. 
To this day still, there are so many Chinese Americans and Asian Americans who are presumed foreign until and unless proven otherwise. Uh, and what it's going to take over the course of the next generation is more Chinese Americans and more Asian Americans entering into civic life, entering into political life, entering into cultural life, entering into academic life, entering into business life as leaders and figures and models and uh, game changers. Uh, so that over time, the next generation does include in its pantheon of pictures, when I say American, the picture of somebody who looks like me, the picture of somebody who looks like Maya Lin, the picture of somebody who looks like um, Goodwin Liu, Justice of the California Supreme Court, the picture of someone who looks like uh, Eddie Wong, uh, the celebrity chef and restaurateur based here in New York City, uh, about whose childhood a new ABC sitcom is going to be airing uh, starting next week called Fresh Off the Boat, right? Uh, that sitcom is one little new exciting data point in what's, I hope, going to be a larger trend of Chinese Americans stepping into the public square, having our identities and our stories and, our, and the full diversity of our varied backgrounds woven into this larger fabric of American narrative. Uh, that's got to happen, and I think that that's, uh, that may not be, strictly speaking, part of the charge and mission statement of the National Committee on uh, U.S.-China Relations, but I would urge all of you to think about the ways in which that is central, actually, to the success of everything you do here. That to the extent that Chinese Americans become more visible, more vocal, more powerful, more engaged, more everything in American life, all of the efforts that you're trying to do here to build bridges of understanding, to avoid controversy and conflict, uh, to uh, get people on both sides of the Pacific to appreciate deeply in their bones the interdependencies that exist between these two countries, all of that work will be accelerated and amplified uh, and helped uh, to the extent that Chinese Americans thrive and succeed. And so our fates too, mine as a Chinese American, yours as uh, participants and members of this organization's network are entwined as well. So um, I just want to close these uh, r remarks with um, one final thought, which is simply this. Um, as you'll see, for those of you who have the chance to read the book, um, I, I try to weave a lot between both the personal and the, and the more broadly either political uh, or historical. Uh, and uh, a lot of, just be given, given my interest and passion in uh, citizenship and, and civic life here in America, a lot of what I spend energy on is just showing ways in which both in the contemporary scene and throughout history, Going back 150 years, Chinese Americans have been shaping our laws, our customs, our palate, our, our systems of education, our institutions of business here in the United States. And that part of our responsibility, all of us, again, uh, is to excavate some of that history uh, and to shine a light on some of its contemporary manifestations. Uh, and if we can do that together, uh, then I think we'll be creating a lot more win-win opportunities for Americans, for Chinese, and for Chinese Americans. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> if, if one isn't convinced by Eric's presentation, I can assure you that uh, this book is accessible, uh, provocative, and uh, to call it simply a memoir, I think, uh, probably does it a disservice because it's also it's a set of reflections on contemporary uh, life as well as, I think, an important uh, set of, of history and civic lessons. And you can, you can hear the breadth uh, uh, that he covers in the book uh, in your presentation today. Uh, I want to uh, uh, use my privilege, I guess, to ask the first question here and then open it up to the floor. Uh, your book does a great job of exploring the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act of 82, and it, it seemed clear to me that this really resonated for you on, on, in a profound way. Um, and in a different way than if you were simply Chinese or not Chinese American. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I'm hoping that uh, you can talk about that a little bit, to expand a little bit on what is it that, that starting from uh, the, the act in 1882 all the way up to Judy Chu's legislation uh, of only a few years ago. What is it in there that, that uh, resonated for you? Well, uh, and again, I, um, I'm, 
I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I should presume that everybody knows what we mean when we say the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. It's on one level self-explanatory in its name. Uh, on the other hand, just its name doesn't convey fully the, the, the historical magnitude of what that act was. It was the first, and indeed, you know, it was the first time in the history of the Republic that an entire group by race had been banned from entering the territory, right? Uh, and it, of course, was the culmination of many decades of anti-Chinese sentiment uh, uh, that arose in the country, in the West, uh, as cheap Chinese labor uh, flooded into the country, right? And uh, white working men uh, uh, parties and uh, activists uh, agitated, uh, particularly in California, uh, and uh, you know, starting with municipal laws in cities like San Francisco to state laws, heck, to the state constitution of California, uh, these activists over time found ways to just confine and cabin and discriminate against, discriminate against and ultimately to uh, outright exclude uh, uh, Chinese from entering the United States. Um, it was, it, 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 so it's number one, historically significant, and it's a piece of history that you know, people in a room like this know or have heard of, but you'd be shocked. You would be shocked how many Americans have never heard of the Chinese Exclusion Act, have no idea about this pretty central <coughs> aspect of American history and this very kind of pivotal moment in the definition of American citizenship, right? Because it really set a precedent for what then in the 1920s would be a whole set of restrictionist immigration laws that also set quotas based on race. But a template was set in the Chinese Exclusion Act. So A, it's of historical significance. But B, um, it's of incredible contemporary relevance as well. Uh, and, and for two reasons. Uh, number one, uh, it really reminds us that um, there are times in American history, uh, and it wasn't just the 1880s, uh, whenever Americans get anxious about their economic prospects, the search for scapegoats, the search for people to blame, uh, will often land first on people who don't look like the native stock Americans of European descent. That, that, that's just a statement of kind of historical immigration and labor history fact, right? Uh, and uh, that was certainly the case uh, in the second half of the 19th century, uh, but it is of relevance today because as China rises, as more Americans uh, across the political spectrum. You can't blame one party or the other for feeding uh, any of this fear or frenzy. Uh, as more Americans across the spectrum start regarding China as threat, as adversary, as not just a you know, friendly competitor, but as kind of zero-sum rival, um, the more those perceptions color, literally and figuratively, perceptions of people who look like me, right? Uh, and to, you know, again, if there's, there are, there are two Chinese names, one from recent history and one from um, uh, not so recent history that make this point. Uh, the, the recent one, of course, is Wen Ho Li. The case of Wen Ho Li uh, and, and the way that Wen Ho Li was um, uh, persecuted and identified and accused of being a, a spy for China at a time when China, when the PRC had made surprising uh, advances in their nuclear weapons technology. Uh, and so all eyes wheeled to, uh, uh, swiveled over to Wen Ho Lee, an uh, 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 immigrant like my parents, uh, a scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratories in New Mexico who was doing nuclear weapons related research. Uh, and you know, aside from the fact that he had had relationships, uh, professional connections uh, in the PRC, had gone to China a couple of times, um, th there wasn't a whole lot in the way of substanti substantiated evidence uh, to say that this guy was a spy. Uh, but he was nonetheless accused. He was thrown into solitary confinement. Uh, he was shackled 23 hours a day. This guy was in, in, in his early 60s at the time. Uh, Mild-mannered scientist uh, and regarded uh, by uh, the administration, PS, the administration I had worked for, the Clinton administration, the Clinton Energy Department, the Clinton Justice Department, uh, and then whipped into a frenzy by the national media, particularly then the New York Times, um, that this was just the kind of the, 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 air, the tip of the spear uh, of a deeper, more insidious Chinese effort to infiltrate American military secrets, to infiltrate American structures of power and, uh, and knowledge. Um, as we all know, at the end of the day, all but one charge was dropped against Wen Ho Lee, uh, a single charge for mishandling of sensitive documents. Uh, as we all know, um, 
the, the executive branch uh, of the United States government, basically, after, after the year plus saga that Flynn Holy went through, uh, basically just turned the page, didn't uh, utter a word of apology. It fell to uh, the federal uh, district court judge in New Mexico uh, to apologize on behalf of at least the judiciary branch of the United States uh, for the way in which uh, Wen Ho Lee had been singled out and persecuted in ways that people thought the late 20th century didn't really happen in America anymore, right? I look at a case like the case of Wen Ho Lee uh, and I see uh, these issues not as academic. Uh, because we are entering a phase again over the coming years, maybe decades, uh, where there might come a time again when uh, there is great anxiety in the United States about our economic prospects, where there's a great desire to scapegoat uh, uh, China, uh, and where eyes turn to people of uh, Chinese descent. Uh, and of course, in the United States, um, you know, the indiscriminate nature of anti-Asian discrimination means that anybody who looks remotely East Asian uh, is going to bear that brunt. Some of you also know the name Vincent Chin. Vincent Chin was a, uh, somebody who lived in Detroit who in the 1980s, when the last time when the United States was uh, suffering economically and Detroit was getting uh, walloped by Japanese automakers and a couple of laid off uh, white automakers uh, uh, saw this Chinese American Vincent Chin uh, outside of a bar in Detroit and uh, uh, said this Jap was to blame and, and they beat him to death. Uh, that he was not Japanese, uh, that he had nothing to do with Japan, that he was Chinese, that he was an American citizen, that he was native born, I irrelevant, right? Th these little moments, again, in a large scheme of things, one might say, hey, it's just one person. Wen Ho Lee is just one guy. Vincent Chin was just one guy, right? Uh, but I think the Chinese Exclusion Act matters because it reminds us that every cascade of, uh, uh, of ethnic um, uh, uh, of this kind of um, uh, exclusionary impulse begins with one case, begins with one guy, right? Uh, if we let it get contagious. Um, the second way in which the, the um, Chinese Exclusion Act matters uh, is that it reverberates into our immigration politics here in the United States today. And this is beyond just Asian or Chinese Americans. But, um, you know, there are a lot of people have probably heard in the context of the immigration reform debates uh, the phrase anchor babies, right? Um, this kind of essentially urban legend, this notional idea that there are uh, immigrants uh, rushing across the border uh, in Mexico here so that they can have babies in America who under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, because they are born in the United States, are citizens of the United States, and those kids born here in the United States become anchors, citizen anchors, to bring in the rest of the family, right? There is in fact very little actual substantiation or evidence that this is what happens. Uh, but it's one of these very useful uh, political myths, uh, like the welfare queen of several decades ago, right, that you just can't kill. Um, and the thing about the anchor baby debate and about, uh, has, is that it has led some immigration restrictiveness to propose that we actually repeal Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, right? Section 1 reads, all persons born or naturalized in the United States uh, are citizens of the United States, right? There are people who, out of this kind of whipped up fear of anchor babies uh, uh, coming from, in most cases, Mexico, but now stories about coming from China as well, right? Um, out of this whipped up fear, want to repeal. And they're not going to get anywhere. They're not going to repeal the first se section one of the 14th Amendment. But the fact that this debate is happening at all is an interesting reminder of another case of another man uh, a long time ago, a uh, Chinese American named Wong Kim Ark. Wong Kim Ark is the named plaintiff uh, in the case United States versus Wong Kim Ark. Uh, he was a uh, San Francisco-born cook in the mid-1800s, um, living in San Francisco. Uh, in 1888, I think, uh, or 1886, sometime after the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act, Wong Kim Ark decided he wanted to go to China to visit some relatives. So he went to China, spent a few months in China, and then he came back, he took the boat back. And when he disembarked at the port of San Francisco, they said, you cannot enter. He said, why? He, they said, you are Chinese, subject to exclusion. Uh, and his, he, he did a very American thing at that point. He lawyered up, uh, and he got uh, lawyers to take his case, and take his case to federal court, and ultimately all the way up to the Supreme Court, making a very simple argument, which is that he was not Chinese, 
subject to exclusion, but that as somebody born in the United States, uh, he was American, uh, subject to the privileges and immunities of citizenship of the United States. Uh, and uh, when his case finally got to the Supreme Court, uh, the court uh, basically had to read that language of Section 1 rather plainly. And they, you know, essentially you could read between the lines and they could say, they were saying, look, it doesn't please us particularly, but to read Section 1 of the 14th Amendment against uh, people of Chinese descent would be to read it against people, would force us to read it against people of Scotch or Irish or German or English descent, and that just won't do, right? Uh, and so in that case, 1898, Wong Kim Ark versus United States, the principle of birthright citizenship was actually enshrined as the law of the land, right? And so these debates that are unfolding today in Congress about immigrants and immigration reform have their origins in a case that was brought because a Chinaman decided to go to court, right? Decided to exercise his right as an American to seek redress in a court of law under rule of law. Uh, and that, to me, um, is the second aspect of why this is such a kind of reverberant uh, story and case. Open it up to a few questions. Okay. Uh, why don't we go with you? Okay. And then we'll I'll, let you I'll let you. I'm interested in, in your. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Bob Peters, I'm Sidley Austin, a member of the committee. Um, I, I'm interested in your concerns about the Haitian heritage citizens of this country. Uh, being turned to and being viewed uh, discriminatorily. Um, because I, I have had a sense, and I'd just like to hear your thoughts on this, that the fact that there's more and more acceptance of the Asian citizens in the United States. You go, for example, to the, you were talking about the Exclusion Act. I learned about the Exclusion Act at the New York Historical Society, mm -hmm. a wonderful exhibit if you haven't seen it, uh, which t deals with many <coughs> of the issues you've been discussing. Um, so you have more of that as more television programs in the professions, and I'm a lawyer in the financial community. Just 180 degree turn from when I started practicing law to today, where there's just significantly more people of Asian descent who really people look on as just being like everybody else. I mean, you don't even notice it anymore. Um, do you think that it's not as good as I'm seeing it? Am I the internal optimist that people accuse me of? Uh, or is there something to that but a danger that it could change? Yeah, I think it's the latter. I, I, I too, am an eternal optimist, and uh, I don't think it's, I think it's a thing to be glad of and proud of and to accept the accusation. Um, that said, I think, you know, it, it, is, it is in fact the case that both of these realities exist simultaneously, right? It, 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 there has never been a better time for Chinese Americans to claim voice and place and opportunity in popular culture, in business, in politics, in the professions, right? There's just never, there's never been a better time, period. Um, and it is happening more rapidly uh, than ever, right? If you look at today's colleges and universities, uh, you can project forward another 25 years and think about all the ways in which, uh, you know, the, the, that, that is going to be growth that is uh, exponential. Um, and it's not only kind of a matter of kind of people count that there's going to be X number more people who are Chinese American partners at Sydney and Austin, or Chinese American um, protagonists in sitcoms, or Chinese American uh, governors or mayors or other politicians. Um, it's also, I think, success will be uh, when increasingly what I think of as a Chinese American way um, gets appreciated, valued, and understood as a way of moving, leading, behaving, organizing, uh, and acting in American life, right? So one of the things that I think is very interesting right now um, is that a lot of Asian Americans, not just Chinese Americans, a lot of Asian Americans, like a lot of women of all races, um, uh, when they enter into professional uh, institutions often feel a pressure to conform to a certain uh, norm, uh, which is essentially in an unstated way um, a male, a white male norm of behaving, right? Uh, and a lot of uh, there, there's a wonderful book uh, that's been a bestseller for the last few years by a, a uh, like me, a, a, a non-practicing lawyer, Susan Cain, uh, a book called Quiet. Uh, and it's a book about the power of introverts, right? And the, and the, and the reasons why um, so much of American life values extroversion, values selling, values the kind of aggressive self-promotion and pitching, um, which works often against people who are just constitutionally 
introverts, right? And then she kind of, in the book, talks about a couple of broad demographic groups um, who by socialization or by culture, whatever it may be, have tended toward behaviors that you might call more introverted. One is women, uh, the other is Asian Americans, right? Uh, for a variety of reasons, Asian American styles, Chinese American styles of self-presentation, of engagement in a group, uh, are not, you know, I was not raised necessarily to put myself out there, to bang the table the loudest, to fake it till you make it, to, you know, uh, to boss people around, to, you know, all, all these things that are kind of validated and valorized in American uh, culture, right? Um, and part of what I think progress will be ultimately is not just to have X number more visible Chinese Americans in various sectors, uh, but to have these other Chinese American styles of being, leading, organizing, and behaving understood as winning styles, understood as success styles, right? So let me give you a concrete example. Uh, Tony Shea, some of you may know. Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos.com, right? The giant online uh, shoe uh, emporium uh, that Amazon bought a couple years ago for a few billion dollars, uh, um, who's Taiwanese, uh, Chinese American. Uh, Tony, um, uh, is a remarkable uh, embodiment of what I think of as this fusion of styles and uh, ways and modes of being, right? Some of you may know uh, what Tony did with the, uh, some of the fortune that he earned in selling Zappos to Amazon is he's, uh, the company's always been based outside of Las Vegas. He actually decided to move his company headquarters to downtown Las Vegas, which some of you may know is kind of the old part of Vegas, the kind of off the strip, the kind of vintage Vegas, but it's also kind of a dilapidated broken down part of town, he moved company headquarters there and he decided to invest $300 million of his own money um, into uh, revitalizing this part of town and creating essentially in, a, in what's civically and geographically a desert, trying to create a garden of entrepreneurs and artists and creative class people and just a whole new ecosystem of interesting activities. It's all run under a thing called the Downtown Project, right? Uh, and I look at Tony and the way he works and what he's done, and there's one strand of him that fits the kind of great classic American individualist cowboy iconoclast entrepreneur, right? He, he went to Zappos and turned this thing into a giant business when everybody was telling him, buying shoes online, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard of, right? People want to try on their shoes. And he was like, uh-uh, we got an idea here that if we kill it with great customer service and create a great brand that people love, we will win, right? And he just, he went this way when everybody was going that way. Right, which you think of in certain ways as kind of the classic American narrative, but the way that he behaves, the way that he runs his company, the way that he's decided to kind of situate his company, again, in this weave of relationship, place, obligation, to create this civic garden in the desert, uh, I think of as deeply Chinese in many ways, right? Um, and his whole way of managing is, if any of you have ever seen him or met him or seen him on TV, um, he, he's extremely taciturn. You, you would think of him as an introvert. You think, I mean, he jokes, he, he, he's so poker-faced and quiet, his friends don't even know he, he, they're his friends, right? Um, and yet, this is a very successful style for him, and it's led to a great deal of trust and loyalty in that organization at Zappos. It's, there, a whole culture has arisen there uh, around this kind of ego-suppressing, outward kind of how do we serve others well uh, mindset. Uh, that's. That's American, it's Chinese, it's a bit of everything, it's a fusion of things, it becomes hard to kind of discern what is what, right? I mentioned Maya Lin earlier. Maya Lin, to me, in her style, in her aesthetic, in her way of being, and certainly in the artifacts of her work, not just the Vietnam Memorial, but pick anything, the Women's Table at Yale, the Civil Rights Memorial that she created, all these, you know, have that same sense of being situated in context, right? A lot of what I write about in my book is about how down to the kind of bare bone elements of language Chinese teaches you to situate in context. Because Chinese is a verb heavy, noun light language with, without a lot of propositions like without, you know, or with. Uh, so much of what you have to understand and learn in speaking and hearing Chinese is in context. It's, it's relational, it's, it has to do with what was said before and after, and that just kind of reverberates out to a mindset that I think can and must be part of the ways in which Chinese Americans reshape American life, right? So that's gotta be part of the progress story, but it's also, we've gotta be able to hold two ideas in our head, that at the same time, 
Um, there are Chinese Americans, again, particularly those on the lower end of the income spectrum. You go down 40 blocks here, you know, uh, there are Chinese Americans who are living in the shadows, who got here last week or two months ago, um, who are not part of any success story, um, who are um, part of a circuit, taking the bus from kind of low-wage job to low-wage job up and down I-95, right, um, and who are um, not part of this vision and who are subject to incredible discrimination, abuse, um, and, and the feeding of negative stereotypes. And so um, I think we've just got to hold this bigger, fuller picture in our heads when we think about what Chinese America is. I think we, we've got time for one more quick Oh gosh, question. I'm sorry, I talked it's too much. Right. <laughs> I think the conversation uh, has been fascinating, but, but we'll get one okay, more well, Let's do two, and I promise I'll be, I'll be, okay. I'll be fast. So, uh, <laughs> let, let's, I, I pointed down at that end of the table. Sure, the, the, the woman. No. Yes, Thank you. Can you um, introduce I'm, yourself? I'm Qing Gao. I'm a professor at Fordham University. I love your books. I gave a few to my friends in China. Oh, great. Uh, especially young people. So good to meet you here. Um, I have a question about uh, the affirmative action, uh, or which is the, uh, the hidden quota against Asians um, in elite colleges and universities. Do you think that's real? And given the long, uh, lawsuits uh, happening, uh, what do you predict uh, will happen in future to um, your kids, your child, my child, uh, the future generation? Uh, do, do we, should we be afraid should, or should we do something? And uh, a related question is, I see still very few Asian politicians. Uh, from your personal experience and observation, is that real? Should we do something to encourage Asians to become politicians? Great questions. Um, Quickly, on, on the first one, affirmative action, um, you know, I'll just start by saying I am a believer in affirmative action. Um, and so I, I take a, a big view of my responsibility as an American, not only my kind of more narrowly self-interested view as a Chinese American or an Asian American. Uh, I believe in affirmative action because I believe there is no such thing as, as I've said before, self-made people and pure merit. Uh, I think we exist in a country where every one of us uh, walks into um, long inherited uh, structures of advantage and disadvantage uh, that have compounded over the centuries uh, through no doing or no fault of, uh, of our own and that part of what we've got to do to set things right and to create opportunity for everybody to make sure that every American does in fact have um, some kind of equal fair shot uh, is that we've got to be willing, I've got to be willing uh, as a Chinese American to accept the fact that diversity is a valid rationale in higher education admissions. Uh, and that, uh, that the rationale of wanting to build a college class, uh, entering freshman class, that is truly diverse and that has people whose test scores may not be as high as mine, uh, but who come from groups that are underrepresented, who uh, come from communities that, are not, that do not have access uh, uh, to uh, these institutions uh, is super important for the institution and for the country, right? And because of that, I am willing to accept uh, the possibility uh, that in spite of higher test scores, I or you know, my daughter uh, you know, may lose, quote unquote, lose a slot to somebody else. But even there, I think it's super important. It goes back to the model minority language, right? When, when, you, when you hear the phrase model minority, I urge all of you to develop the reflex to swat it down. Right? Don't accept anybody saying that word, because when you talk about a model minority, first of all, like I said, it, it obscures all the people who are not even model, you know, kind of having that, that, that stereotypical success. Uh, but number two, if you're talking about one group as a model minority, you are basically saying other groups are not so model. Right? You're basically uh, passive aggressively uh, putting down uh, African Americans, Latinos, uh, Native Americans. And uh, you know, I, I just don't think that, um, uh, that is, um, I, I want no part in that. Uh, I, I don't want to be used as anybody's pawn in that kind of um, let's pit people of color against one another uh, game. And when it comes to college admissions, um, right now that argument has been framed and phrased as, boy, these deserving high scoring Asian American applicants are getting bumped by, and it's always, the story always goes this way, they're getting bumped by black kids who don't score as well. Well, okay, but guess what? They're also getting bumped by fifth-generation legacy 
white admittees um, who also didn't score very well. They're also getting bumped by people of every color who are awesome athletes. <laughs> uh, and the college wants the awesome athlete. They're getting bumped by people for a variety of reasons, right? But our fixation on this bespeaks a larger kind of divide and conquer dynamic that, as I say, I don't want to be part of. Your second question about Asian American and Chinese American politicians, um, yeah, I mean, so sort of to what, what, what you were saying earlier, I mean, um, it's getting better, and it needs to get better a whole lot faster, right? Uh, th there are, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time just in my work at Citizen University with rising generation, you know, with millennials. Um, and there are a ton of millennial Asian Americans who are getting involved in elective politics, who are working in government, who are getting involved in nonprofits, who are kind of thinking about civic life, who are getting involved in law, uh, and, and just thinking about their kind of civic public role and responsibility. But it's still not nearly enough, right? And, uh, and we don't nearly have enough examples and models. One of my, I know one of your fellow committee members and, uh, or, or board members uh, and, and a mentor of mine, Gary Locke, um, you know, Gary had a lot to do with why I moved out to Seattle. Um, you know, I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, but I, the first time I went out to Seattle, I was just lit with this vision that this was a place in a part of the country where not only would you have, at that time, you know, a, a Chinese-American governor like Gary Locke, but I'll never forget the first time I went to visit Seattle and I, you know, uh, left the apartment I was staying in, I looked down the street, and the mailman was delivering mail, and he was an Asian-American mailman. And I realized growing up in Poughkeepsie, I'd never seen an Asian American mailman. I'd never seen Asian American bus drivers. I'd never seen Asian American judges. I'd never seen Asian American cops, right? And all of that was happening in, um, uh, in Seattle in a way that made me think, yes, there's a full spectrum of ways in which Asian Americans can and must be claiming a place in public life. Uh, and elective politics definitely uh, is one of them. So you know, all of us have to do more. And, um, uh, and, and Citizen University, we paid particular attention to young people of color getting involved in civic life. Last question. Okay, so uh, the, the beginning of your book. Introduce yourself. Okay, I'm Horace from China Daily. So at the beginning of our book, we talked a lot about Confucianism and you talked about your struggle in uh, mastering Mandarin. Uh, the, I, I'm just wondering why did you include this part uh, of your experience in your book? What has all these experiences mean to you? And my second question <laughs> is about <laughs> Olivia, your daughter. Uh, your daughter first claimed herself to be Ming, but not Olivia, a Chinese instead of English. But later, as she grew up, she changed from Olivia, no, she changed from Ming back to Olivia again. So how, like, I think it has been quite some years. How would you comment on, yeah. on that? Great. Um, so, you know, the first part of the question, uh, I, the whole first chapter of the book, uh, is about my reckoning with um, both language and and certain precepts of Confucian thinking, um, and I write about the ways in which you know when I was when I was in college, uh, um, you know I took uh, 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 the great famous survey course that Jonathan Spence taught on the history of modern China, and um, and one of the assigned readings was the Analects of Confucius, and it was in it was the Penguin edition translated by D. C. Lao. Uh, you know, in English, and, and I remember back then when I read it, and again when I reread it now, you know, many years later, uh, I found it. I found the English translation utterly stultifying, stupid, boring, and kind of you know, uh, inscrutable. Right? Uh, it was just as I read it, I was just like, what's the big deal? This is like, this is either stating the obvious or just stating stuff in ways that make you know that that that, that, that do not move me at all. Um, and so I knew that um, you know. Uh, several billion people can't be wrong, right? And so uh, the shortcoming must have been my own. And so I thought the, the way to really properly understand and appreciate this um, would be to actually try to navigate some of it in Chinese. Uh, and so I undertook with my mother uh, a many months process of just going through certain of the Analects of Confucius um, in what was a painstaking, but I think really ultimately very rewarding close reading, right? Uh, where I would first find you know, a precept that I found intriguing in English, uh, and then asked her to find it in Chinese, right? And then she would find it both in the kind of archaic, original kind of literary uh, Chinese, and then in the kind of bai hua, the, 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 the more kind of contemporary, uh, uh, chi you know, Chinese. Uh, and we would go through each layer of it, kind of unpacking the meaning uh, in each layer. And I tell that story in the book because that kind of excavation ultimately is what anybody search for 
blankness is. In my case, it's Chineseness. If you're of Italian descent, you're trying to understand what's your Italianness. You know, if you're German, it's what's your Germanness. And it's through language and kind of cultural precept when you kind of peel the layers of the onion um, that, that, that it starts to, to, to emerge. Um, which brings me finally to, you know, to Olivia, my daughter, as I say, third generation Chinese American, but uh, ethnically half Chinese, ethnically half Scotch, Irish, Jewish, mix of things. Um, and at, she's 15 now, um, but at various times in her life, she has, um, you know, I mean, it, it kind of orbit and kind of planetary gravitational pull. At different times, felt more closely bound to Chineseness and Chinese identity. Right? There was a period uh, when she was seven or eight, where she felt very intensely bound to that, um, and that's when she um, decided she's a very strong little girl. Decided just one day, without warning to anybody. Um, she just told her second grade teacher and her classmates uh, that she was no longer Olivia, she was now Ming. Uh, because her name in Chinese is Lu Ming, you know, and uh, she was Ming. She crossed out her nameplate, she wrote Ming, you know, the whole thing. And she was just, and everybody's like, okay, Ming, you know, and, uh, and everybody kind of, you know, and for a stretch, of, a long stretch of months, um, uh, you know, she and I bonded intensely on all things Chinese, right? And, um, and it was a period of life uh, uh, where there was just a lot of, turbulence in our family, and, and, and a lot of why I tell that story is about how that aspect of identity for her was anchoring, was centering, right, uh, until she no longer needed it. Uh, and after that point when she no longer needed it, equally kind of cut and dried, strong-willed, she similarly announced to me and everybody else, okay, I'm done, like, I'm Olivia again, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, this is a, this is a, this is a parenting question. Right? But it, it, it's, it's a multicultural parenting question, but it's also just a parenting question in general about how much we let our children form their own paths, create their own voices, make their own songs out of the music we have fed them, and how much we try to direct that. Um, as I write in the book, I am whatever the taxonomical opposite is of a tiger parent, I am that, right? Puppy parent or panda, whatever it is, right? I, I am so not a tiger parent. I am the product of uh, parents who are not tiger parents. Uh, uh, and, and so I believe very strongly that, uh, you know, my job is to lay a foundation, as I have with language and culture and, 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 and certain aspects of uh, Chinese identity. Uh, and now her job is to make her own story. Uh, and I think that, uh, I suppose, ultimately, is a, a very American way of thinking. It's a, it's a lyrical and, and quite lovely, uh, quite lovely portion of the book, and, a, and an unfortunate uh, that we have to end here tonight. I, I do want to uh, plug the book one more time. We have copies in the back available for for sale and Sign perhaps even signing. Signs, absolutely. Um, so please uh, uh, stick around if you'd like a book and. Otherwise, just join me in thanking Eric uh, once again for yeah. coming. I just, I just want to thank all of you again for coming tonight. Uh, uh, Jan and, and John, I, I just want to thank you uh, so much for having me and hosting us and uh, look forward to chatting with you all some more as we uh, sign books. Thanks for coming. <coughs>